how do we physicists think? Most of it is when we're quiet, all by ourselves. We stare out the window and have blocks of equations just wandering in our head until these equations fit together. And then we get a sheet of paper and scribble. It can be very frustrating at times, scribbling equations everywhere. The old cliche of scribbling on the back of the envelope often is true because that's sometimes all you have around. He was always thinking in pictures, visualizing things. When his father gave him a compass, he would just sit up night after night watching the needle point northward. He would send chills down his spine. Einstein once said, I want to know God's thoughts in a mathematical way. Einstein wanted an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that would encapsulate all physical laws. The beauty, the majesty, the power of the universe into a single equation. That was his life's goal. In 1900, Albert Einstein is a 21-year-old undergraduate at the Swiss Federal Polytechnic. That this young man will one day be synonymous with genius was something none of his professors would have predicted. He would cut class. The professors thought he was a goof-off. As a consequence, Einstein couldn't get a single job after graduation. He even thought about switching fields and selling insurance. Can you imagine opening the door one day and there's Albert Einstein selling you life insurance? What a waste. Einstein thought he was such a loser. He wrote a letter to his family saying that it would be better if perhaps he was never born. Nobody was talking about the young Albert Einstein. He worked as a substitute teacher in short jobs in various towns. Einstein's father tried to apply on behalf of Einstein for academic positions. And he wrote to a very famous professor and asked him whether he could use Einstein as a research assistant. But there were no positions available. His father passes away thinking that young Albert is a total disgrace to the family. In 1902, the depressed and despondent young Albert moves to Bern, Switzerland's capital, and begins a career far from science. One of his friends arranges for Einstein to get a job as a lowly patent clerk in the Swiss patent office. In this office, on the third floor, Einstein spends six days a week reviewing applications submitted by all kinds of inventors to the Swiss government. Given a patent, you had all this information, and he had to strip it down to the essence. And that honed his skills as a physicist. He would very quickly dash off all the patents that he had to analyze. He didn't find the work very strenuous. It was not so intellectually uh, demanding. And it would give him ample time to contemplate the universe. He never would have been very good at a university kissing up to a senior professor. He was much better at a stool in the patent office, trying to daydream about what is it like to ride alongside a light beam. From that job, he would launch a revolution which would change world history. Einstein's idle daydreams will profoundly change the way the universe is understood. In 1905, in what's been called his miracle year, he publishes in his spare time four visionary papers, the first of which answers the age-old question, what is light? The photoelectric effect. This paper, written by this total unknown, showed that light comes as a particle called the photon. We use that in television. We use that in lasers. In another paper, the 26-year-old Einstein posits something we now take for granted, the existence of atoms. 
people didn't believe in atoms in those days, but we proved that atoms can actually make small little dust particles move in a liquid. And he calculated the size of atoms. These papers would have been a remarkable career for any physicist, but Einstein is far from finished. He writes yet another paper with the famous equation E equals mc squared. At the simplest level, this means energy can become matter, and matter can become energy. The tiniest speck of matter holds potentially huge amounts of energy. Unleashing it requires a nuclear reaction, the sort going on constantly in the night sky. Ever since people began to look up in the heavens, they would say, what makes the stars shine? But it took Albert Einstein to answer the question. Mass, M, turns into E, energy. That is the engine that lights up the stars. Today, E equals mc squared is Einstein's most famous equation. But another theory he publishes this same year is more important and more controversial. The special theory of relativity. When Einstein was a teenager, he enjoyed imagining what it would be like to ride a beam of light. Now, he returns to this daydream, and it changes his life. In the spring of 1905, Einstein was riding on a bus, and he looked back at the famous clock tower that dominates Bern, Switzerland. And then he imagined, what happens if that bus were racing near the speed of light? In his imagination, Einstein looks back at the clock tower, and what he sees is astonishing. As he reaches the speed of light, the hands of the clock appear frozen in time. Einstein would later write, a storm broke in my mind. All of a sudden, everything, everything kept gushing forward. Einstein knows that back at the clock tower, time is passing normally. But on Einstein's light speed bus, as he reaches the speed of light, the light from the clock can no longer catch up to him. The faster he races through space, the slower he moves through time. This insight sparks the birth of Einstein's special theory of relativity, which says that space and time are deeply connected. In fact, they are one and the same, a flexible fabric called space-time. Sitting alone on a city bus, Einstein believes he has glimpsed a secret of the universe. For Einstein, space was this place where stuff was, and it didn't do anything. It had stuff in it. And so space combined with time to become space-time is a more dynamic understanding of this arena that everything takes place in. It's becoming more alive in a way. He's saying very, very outlandish and very, very strange things. Rarely had anything so radical been submitted to Europe's most prestigious scientific journals. He was a complete outsider to the physics of his day, as he was being in Switzerland, being a patent clerk. And yet he was ambitious enough to think that he could challenge the whole of the established physics at the time. You always hope that there will be total euphoria, that everybody will say this is a, you know, a huge step forward in the subject. But that rarely happens. Whatever one's concept of time, it passes slowly for Einstein at the patent office. He submits papers to important scientific journals, the best scientific journals, and hopes for the best. And the best doesn't come for a while. He was anxious. What was the reaction of the physics community to his great paper? Silence. Einstein got very depressed. Three, four, five months must have felt like an eternity to him. And then Einstein's papers fall into the hands of perhaps the one man who can fully understand him, Max Planck. Max Planck is the greatest theoretical physicist in Europe. Planck was the editor of the Annalen der Physik in Berlin. The most important physics journal of the time here was Max Planck reading this paper from this unknown physicist. And Max Planck says, ah, there is something here. Planck recognized immediately that this was an important paper from an important young scholar. The Relativity paper was published in June 1905. 
That volume, number 17, is now one of the most famous publications in the history of science. 